هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجهنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معلمنا ورسول الله معلمنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد ما جيب بدرس السلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so we're going to be discussing the fourth hadith of Imam Nawawi's 40 hadith and this is actually a, a very relevant hadith and there's a lot of lessons that need to be learned from this hadith. So let us start off with the very beginning uh, of the hadith where it says, where Imam Nawawi rahimahullah he says, عن أبي عبد الرحمن عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله عنه قال حدثنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو الصادق المصدوق. So this hadith is narrated by Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu and Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was one of the early companions that accepted Islam in Mecca. Now you notice that he starts off this hadith by saying that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he is a sadiq al-masduq. The term as sadiq means he is the one that speaks the truth and al-masduq it means the person whose um, honesty has been proven, whose honesty has been proven and legislated. Now why does Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu start off with this disclaimer that he is the trustworthy one and his trustworthiness has been affirmed. The reason why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu starts off with this disclaimer is because of the content that is going to be coming in to this hadith. As we know that when Islam first came, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself was unable to read and write and this was the case of the vast majority of people. So even in terms of progress, in terms of science and particularly medical studies, very little was discovered. And with the coming of Islam, science progressed very very quickly in terms of its theoretical knowledge. Because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed knowledge that was unknown to mankind at that time. And that was the knowledge of how the human being is formed. So if you look inside the very first verses of Surah Al-Mu'minun, you'll notice that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala discusses the concept of how the fetus is formed and what happens in the womb and the different stages of human life at that time. And this is why Abdullah Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he starts off with this disclaimer that he is a Sadiq al-Masduq. Can someone just ask the brothers who are talking in the back to please stay quiet, inshallah? Jazakumullah khair. And this is why he gives this disclaimer that he is a Sadiq al Masduq. Now, what is the effect of this disclaimer in terms of Aqidah, in terms of our faith? What effect does this have? It has a huge effect, my dear brothers and sisters. And that effect is that anything the Messenger of Allah وسلم, came with, it needs to be accepted. So anything that is authentically attributed to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, it cannot be rejected whatsoever. In Surah Al-Hujurat, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala He describes the believers. He says they're the ones that believe in Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala and the Messenger ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا And then they have no doubt about this whatsoever. So anything that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with or Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala said, then it has to be accepted without a shadow of a doubt. So now a situation arises. What if there is a hadith that is in contradiction and it's in contradiction to two things. Number one, with another hadith and number two, with science. So let's talk about in terms of hadith being in contradiction to other uh, revelation. So we'll make it general, not just other hadith, but other revelation, whether it is the Quran or the Sunnah, how do you deal with contradictions between different forms of revelation? Imam ibn Khuzayma rahimahullah, he died in the year 311. He died in the year 311. And he made a very pompous claim. And that claim was that anyone that ever finds any contradiction in uh, revelation between either one hadith or another, or one hadith in the Quran, then let him bring it to me. Then let him bring it to me and I will reconcile it for him. And I will reconcile it for him. So the point that he was trying to make is that there is not going to be any contradiction in revelation because the source of that revelation is one. That source of revelation is one. 
So what are possible reasons that one may find an apparent contradiction? Because it's not going to be a real contradiction, but what are reasons that a person might find an apparent contradiction? And you're going to find three main reasons for that. Three main reasons for that. Reason number one is that it is not authentically established. So particularly when it comes to a hadith, you will find some hadith that may contradict one another, but some of them are authentic, others of them are not. And if something is inauthentic, then obviously it cannot be used as a proof. It cannot be used as a proof. A second reason why you may find contradiction between, uh, apparent contradiction between revelation is the concept of nasikh and mansukh, is the concept of abrogation. So Islam came as a very practical religion. And that being said, there are certain things that were revealed in uh, gradually, they weren't revealed all at one time. The easiest example of this is that of alcohol. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He prohibited alcohol, it was prohibited in three main stages. It was prohibited in three main stages until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally prohibited alcohol altogether. So that is a second reason why a person may find an apparent contradiction, but in reality it isn't a contradiction, it's just that it is something has abrogated the command or has abrogated the ruling. The third reason why a person may find a contradiction, and that is that in reality that concept or that point is not from the Messenger of Allah وسلم, himself, but from a Sahabi is from a Sahabi. So when the Sahabi or the person narrating, narrating the hadith, he actually introduces something from himself into the hadith itself. And the reason why I mention this one in particular is because this is something we're going to see in this hadith. Where Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he introduced something from himself to explain something from the hadith, to explain something from the hadith. So we need to find out that yes, even if it is authentic, are these truly the words of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or is there something introduced from the Sahabi himself? From the Sahabi himself. A fourth reason that you will find apparent contradiction and that is particularly when it comes to the Hadith as opposed to the Qur'an, the Qur'an is preserved in wording and in meaning. Meaning that the wording of the Qur'an will never change. The meaning of the Qur'an will never change. Whereas the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they are preserved in meaning and not necessarily in wording. Meaning that the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum, they used to take the luxury that if they did not remember the word, they would use a term that was synonymous with that term. So as long as the meaning was preserved, they didn't have a problem narrating the hadith. And sometimes a person or a sahabi or the person narrating the hadith may use a term that is not truly synonymous and that is what causes the contradiction. And that is what causes the contradiction. So those are four primary reasons and the scholars have listed up to seven, some of them even up to ten different reasons why a person may find an apparent contradiction. But in reality it will not be a contradiction. Now we get to issue number two. And that is, what if an individual finds an apparent contradiction between science and um, the revelation? And rather than using the term science, we're going to use the term intellect. Because science is a product of our intellects. And this is the term that the earlier scholars used. And one of the great, I guess, theses, if you want to call it that, that was written on this subject, was written by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. It was called, Dar ta'arud al-aqal lin naqal that removing all of the doubts relating to the contradictions between intellect and revelation. So the first thing that's important to understand over here is that the source of revelation and the creator of the intellect again is one and the same. So if they are both from the creator then there shouldn't be any contradiction. Then there shouldn't be any contradiction. So where will the contradiction come from? Where will the contradiction come from? The contradiction will come from two main cases in this situation. Case number one is that there is a flaw in the understanding. There is a flaw in the understanding, a flaw in the logic. So the logical deduction that mankind comes to, that's where the flaw is. Whereas the text within of itself is perfectly fine and there's no issue with it whatsoever. A second reason that actually, sticking to the first reason first, um, another thing related to reason number one is that there's a flaw in logic or a, 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 a flaw in the deduction is that this can also be applied to progress in science. So as science progresses and as science develops, obviously theories will change. 
right? And as what was known as a fact 50 years ago is no longer considered a fact now because our understanding of the world, our understanding of science is developing. So this will go under category number one. Then the second reason why a person may find a contradiction or an apparent contradiction between uh, intellect and revelation, then this is from one of the points from part number one, and that is that perhaps there is uh, the narration that is being referred to is inauthentic. Perhaps the narration that is being referred to is inauthentic. So those are generally how these scholars address the issue of contradiction between revelation and contradiction between um, science and intellect within themselves. Two people that paid a lot of attention to this from the people of the past was Ibn Taymiyyah in his thesis Dar al Aqal al Naqal. And in our time, someone who paid more close attention to the concept of revelation within of itself was Shaykh Muhammad Amin al Shankiti. So, Shaykh Muhammad Amin al Shankiti, ta'ala, what he did was he took all of the verses and all of the hadith that people had a problem with. So, the hadith that you know the sun bows down to the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every day as it uh, rises and sets. And the hadith that, you know, if one part of the wing of the fly has the poison in it, then the other part of the wing has the cure in it. All of these narrations, people will have a problem with. They're like, how do we understand these things? How can this actually be, be true? And Sheikh Muhammad Amin al-Shanqiti, he has a book that he compiled uh, dealing with all of the verses and the hadith that are problematic on the apparent. And you can research more uh, about that book bin ta'ala. So that is why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu started off with this disclaimer that he is a sadiq al masduq that anything that comes from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa his truthfulness, his trustworthiness has already been established. So you cannot deny it because to doubt it or to deny it, then this would be disbelief. If you were to doubt it or to deny it, then this would be disbelief. Now let's actually get into the actual text of the hadith itself. So we're going to just say it in English with the exception of one part of Bidhinlahi Ta'ala. So he says, Verily the creation of any one of you takes place when he is assembled in his mother's womb for 40 days. When he's assembled in his mother's womb for 40 days. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he talks about the very uh, concept of how human beings are developed. And this is one of the scientific miracles of the Quran. So obviously this knowledge was not known at the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not with the doctors, not with the Muslims, not with the previous religions, but this is one of the things that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed to prove that this was a revelation from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Himself. And this brings us to a topic of you know, one of the criticisms that is made against the Qur'an is a criticism known as Hagarism. And what Hagarism actually is, is it is an accusation against the Prophet Wasallam that he compiled the Qur'an from previous sources. So they say that when the Prophet Wasallam, you know, went to go see uh, Waraka ibn Nawfal, that's when he had knowledge of the Bible. So he took some of the Bible and made it into the Qur'an. And when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, he had interaction with the Jews of Medina and he took uh, some of the Torah and he put that into the Quran as well. And that is how the Prophet ﷺ put the Quran together. And that is in just brief summary what Hagarism actually is. Now, one of the simplest ways to refute that concept is how about that material that isn't found inside of the previous scriptures. And this is a clear example of it. That the form of uh, how human beings were formed and developed is not mentioned in any of the previous scriptures. But rather this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran itself. And something like this in our day and age, it may not uplift our iman because alhamdulillah science has now reached that level where we understand these things. In fact, so much so that, you know, when a couple who is expecting a baby, they go to a doctor now, even before the baby is born, they can tell what the gender is. And I'm not just talking about, you know, just a, a simple, what's the word called? Ultrasound. Not in the ultrasound. Antinatal. Mm, it's not the ultrasound, I'm thinking of a different word. But the simple version of it is the ultrasound. But even the ultrasound has been taken to a next level. Like the ultrasound is usually just in 2D form and it's like black and white. But now technology has come to such a level, it actually creates a 3D image of the baby and you can see a 3D image of the baby while it's inside the mother's womb. 
And that is how far technology has come. So in our day and age, it may not uplift our spirits, but you can imagine for the Bedouin man that has no understanding of how you know, the human being is developed, or even the philosopher at that time. If you look at you know, uh, Aristotelian philosophy and how they perceived the development of human being, they just considered it you know, one tiny, tiny human being. And that tiny human being over time gradually grew inside the mother's stomach, and that's, what's ca that's what came out. So that's what the Greek philosophers of old used to assume. That's the, what happened with the human being. And that's you know, how the human being came about. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the first time introduces to mankind the concept of how the fetus actually develops. Now the first stage, as is mentioned of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over here, is that of the combination of the two fluids. Is the combination of the two fluids. Mm -hmm. Now when looking at this subject from the Qur'an and the Ahadith, there's two important distinctions to keep in mind. One was the creation of Adam alayhi salam, and the second was the creation of human beings themselves. And a lot of the times people will get this confused. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he talks about the creation of Adam alayhi salam, or the creation of mankind as a whole, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say that mankind as a whole was created from dust or was created from dirt. And people assume that, hey, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that our creation came from dust and dirt. Yes, as a species, that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam. Whereas all of us now, we're past that stage. Our first stage is this phase known as the nutfa. The first phase is known as the nutfa. And that is a combination of the two liquids, the liquid of the male and the liquid of the female as they uh, climax, that liquid is released. And SubhanAllah, if you study this, this is like one of the, the greatest you know, miracles that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has created. And inshallah, I don't think we have any young kids here. Do we have any young kids here? I don't want to give them their first introduction to <laughs> you know, sex ed here. <laughs> Do we have any kids here? No kids, right? Speak freely, not too freely. Shyness is from Islam. So, just to, to keep it very simple, the miraculous point that I'm talking about is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send one egg from the uh, woman's womb. And this one egg will be approached literally by millions and hundreds of thousands of sperm. And it is just one of the millions, one of the hundred thousands out of the various possibilities that could you know, happen at that time that one gets selected and one gets chosen and through that combination that is where the human being comes from. That is where the human being comes from. And then the second phase of this miraculous nature is how from two liquids Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings about a solid. From two liquids, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings about a solid of flesh, of skin, of bone, of intellect. From two things that you know, have no value whatsoever. You can't do anything with those liquids other than you know, reproduce human creation, subhanAllah. So it shows you the miraculous nature of this. So this is the first phase that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is referring to. Now what's important about this aspect of the hadith is that the term nutfa, is it actually a part of the hadith? Or is this something that Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu introduced into the hadith? So the first thing we look at is that if you look at the versions of this hadith, and this hadith is mentioned by many, many people. It's mentioned by Bukhari, by Muslim, by Ahmad, by Abu Dawood, by Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah. So, you know, a lot of the major collections of hadith, they will have this hadith. When you look at the version of Bukhari and Muslim though, you will find that the term nutfa is not actually a part of it. The term nutfa is not actually a part of it. And this is a, one of the earliest indications that shows us that this was idraj. And what idraj actually means, it was introduced by the companion himself to explain this concept. So, why is this so important and relevant? Why is this important and relevant? It is important and relevant because once you introduce this term nutfa, then it changes the whole meaning of the hadith. Because with the term nutfa, it means that the first 40 days of this phase is known as the nutfa phase. And then you have a second 40 day phase, and then you have a third 40 day phase. That is the implication of it. And you'll see from a fiqh perspective, that has a huge implication for two reasons. Number one, is the issue of the janazah, the issue of the janazah. 
Because if we say that each phase is 40 and then the soul is introduced at the 120th day, then that means that the janazah should only be prayed after the 120th day. And likewise, the issue of abortion. Has a woman killed a soul when she has an abortion before 40 days, after 40 days, after 120, after 120 days? What is the issue here? So that is why the term nutfa is of the utmost significance in this narration. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but the term nutfa is not actually a part of the hadith. It was not said by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And this obviously has great ramifications now. And that great ramification being that rather than the soul being introduced on the 120th day, now the new meaning of the hadith is that the soul is introduced on the 40th day. That the new meaning is that the soul is introduced on the 40th day. And we'll discuss some of these issues as we go along. So he goes that he is assembled in his mother's womb for 40 days and then he is a drop of flu. That is the term nutfa. That is the idraj from Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Then it becomes a clot for a similar period. The second phase is the phase known as alaqa. And when blood becomes clotted or coagulated, that is when it becomes alaqa. And this is the second phase where now from those, uh, the, the two liquids meeting, it now becomes a form of blood. And this clot, this clot of blood where it becomes coagulated and jelly-like, it actually clings to the womb. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a second insight in terms of what's happening. So it's not just inside the womb, but it's clinging to the uterus at that time. And this is something again the doctors did not know and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about. And this is the second phase of it where it becomes an alaqa. And then thereafter, it is a lump looking like, and the term over here used is mudgha. The term mudgha over here is a lump like looking thing. And to get a clear example of mudgha, is that I want you to imagine that you've been chewing a piece of gum. When you take that piece of gum out, what does that gum look like? That gum will look like you know, all wrinkly and, you know, shaped up in a, in a curved form. That is exactly what a mudgha is. That is exactly what a mudgha is. It's like a, a chewed piece of flesh, a chewed piece of meat. That is the third face that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to over here for a similar period. Then an angel is sent to him who breathes the ruh into him. And we said that this is where the ikhtilaf takes place amongst the scholars. That is it at 40 days or is it at 120 days? Because if it's at 40 days, then it means that all three phases took place within the 40 days. However, if we say that nutfa is a part of the hadith, then nutfa is for 40 days. And alaqa is for 40 days. And uh, mudgha uh, is for 40 days. And that gives us 120 days. And 120 days. This angel is commanded to write, uh, blows the spirit into him. Actually, let's comment on this. The concept of the spirit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he refers to the spirit in Surah Al-Isra. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ That the people, they ask you about this spirit. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes the discussion by saying that this is from the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا أُوْتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And you have not been given of knowledge except for a little bit. Now what exactly does that mean you have not been given a except a little bit of knowledge? There's obviously the general understanding that our knowledge compared to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like comparing finite numbers to infinity, right? That's the relationship between our knowledge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there's a greater implication over here. And that greater implication, my dear brothers and sisters, is the miraculous nature of life itself. Do we have any doctors in the house, by any ways? We have a doctor here, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so you can collaborate this if I make a mistake, inshallah. And I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. I want you to imagine that we take someone's heart, okay? May Allah protect you, Hisham. We take your heart. We take Sajjad's brain, okay? We take, you know, Rizwan's body as a whole, okay? And we'll take someone else's blood. We'll take Ahmad's blood, okay? Now we have a brain, we have a heart, we have the whole body, and we have Ahmad's blood. If we were to put all of these things together, could we create human life? Could we create human life? You have a functioning heart, a functioning mind, functioning blood, a functioning body. Everything is there that physically is needed to create human life. You still wouldn't be able to create human life. 
Because from a Muslim's perspective, what brings life into the individual is the ruh that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places therein. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees for that ruh to be taken out, even though you may have a perfectly healthy body, life will cease to exist. Life will cease to exist. And this is the miraculous nature of وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا That you do not have except a little bit of knowledge. That even with, you know, as far as we've progressed, we do not understand truly what this ruh is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. And this is what the ruh is referring to over here. Then he goes on to say, then an angel is sent to him who breathes the ruh into him. And this angel is commanded to write four decrees. He is commanded to write four things. He is commanded to write down his risk. He is commanded to write down his lifespan. He is uh, commanded to write down his deeds. And whether he will be from the happy people or the wretched people. Commenting briefly on the happy people or the wretched people. This is not just referring to happiness and wretchedness in this life, but it is referring to the greater element of happiness versus, meaning the people of Jannah, versus wretchedness being the people of Nar and Jahannam. That is what it is referring to. Now this leads us into the element of Qadr. You know, and we're going to have a bigger discussion on Qadr in the second part of this hadith. But our belief in Qadr as Muslims consists of four levels. Does anyone know what the four levels of our belief in Qadr are? We've discussed this a couple of times in the past. Our, qadr, our belief in Qadr as Muslims consists of four different levels. We need to believe in four different things to properly believe in Qadr. Any Muslims in the house? <laughs> Go for it. I'm not sure if it's, uh, it is the first Qadr which was written uh, 50,000 years before the Khalq. Are you referring to that? No, okay, so those are the different types of Qadr, but I'm talking the different levels of Qadr we have to believe in. Can I just, uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, the uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before the creation of earth, uh, made all, I mean, uh, at what given time I really don't know, but he created all the human beings at one time. And he told everybody to bow, and then everybody bowed. Then th that's the reason the kafirs are there because kafirs previously had bowed and that time he did not uh, they did not bow later on when they they uh, went down to there. So uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has already created uh, all human beings, all of us, and has given us uh, our uh, nasib also our khadr. Fantastic. That's the first thing. Second thing. Okay. Is, uh, oh, uh, okay. Thank I you. didn't know. I'll let you finish and I'll comment on it. Go ahead, please continue. Okay. And uh, then uh, the other other thing is that once the person uh, comes and comes down to the earth, of course, uh, as per the narration, when the person is bo uh, born in the or a person is in the womb of in the uterus of the mother, that time the uh, the khadar or his uh, fate is already being created. Uh, is there. now there is a concept about if, for example, the person is a good doer, is a movement, right, and he has a calamity. Does the, he have similar type of calamity? Does he have a, exactly the same? No, it gets modified a little bit, and that because of uh, even the khadr changes. Even the khadr changes. If the person is a really a good, pious Muslim, then he will not have that same exposure of calamity as a kafir person, and that that's why uh, it says that the, even the calamity or the the degree of uh, the bala or the degree of the uh, bad. Uh, effect on an accident or something can also be modified uh, this one so th this that's your understanding really? of it. you went on a completely different tangent yeah, but, but for the most part what you're saying is accurate for the most part of what you're saying is accurate just to make a brief commentary on the first thing that you were saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all human oh. beings that's not a hundred percent true Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our spirits before the, our physical bodies were created oh. and that's the world of the of the ruh and this is if you refer to um, Surah Al-A'raf, Surah number 7, verse 172, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this concept of the mithaq. And the mithaq is a covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took, where He asked all of the souls, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And so there wasn't actual bowing down, but He posed the question to them, that am I not your Lord? And everyone said yes. So that is the, the first part that you were talking about, and we'll talk about the second part in my discussion over here. So talking about the maratib of qadr that are comp uh, compulsory to believe in. So these are the levels of qadr that in order to understand qadr, in order to be a believer, you may not know the terminologies, but you have to agree with these general concepts. And there are four levels, so let's everyone memorize them now, bithinillahi ta'ala. Number one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ultimate knowledge of four things. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ultimate knowledge of four things. The past, the present, the future, and if there was a way to have an alternate reality, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have known that as well. So that is how vast Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is. And that is the first element of Qadr, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. There is nothing that is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second element of Qadr is that our Qadr, what is written down for us, was written down 50,000 years before the heavens, creation of the heavens and the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the pen and he told the pen to write and the pen wrote everything that will exist from that time till the day of judgment. So anything that is meant to happen in our lives doesn't happen by chance. It doesn't happen just out of a random act. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has meticulously and diligently planned this all together. So all of this was written down 50,000 years before. And this is going to take us into our discussion, what Hisham was talking about. The different types of writing of Qadr. So the greatest form of writing of the Qadr is known as the Lawh al-Mahfuz. And that is what was written 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. And we'll talk about the different types of writings after I finish the four points. Point number three is that nothing happens except by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The term in Arabic is Mashiach. And there's two terms that are used synonymously, but are not used synonymously. And it is at this third, third stage of our belief in Qadr that people make the greatest amount of mistakes. And that is that they are unable to, unable to differentiate between the Mashiach of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, versus the irada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, versus what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually wants for us and we'll explain this as well. So the third level is that nothing happens except by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the fourth level and this is the final and fourth level is that all of our actions are created. All of our actions are created. The good of them are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The bad of them are from our own selves. The bad of them are from our own selves. So these are the four levels of Qadr. Can anyone repeat them back to me? Go for it. So the first one is that Allah has knowledge of everything. Yep. The second one is the pens that wrote the 50,000 years before the creation. Yep. The third one is that um, uh, that all, all the good and bad, well, that's the fourth one, the good and bad come from Allah, or the good comes from Allah, and the bad comes from us. And the third one was Nothing happens except Nothing happens except, by the except by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now let's expand on these points. And you'll see the significance of writing these things down. Because I'm telling you, you're not going to remember this if you're trying to memorize this at the end of the halaqa. Um, so talking about point number uh, two now. With the writing down of the qadr. The writing down of the qadr. The greatest form of the writing down of qadr is the qadr that was written down in the Lawh al-Mahfuz. And this is the Qadr that will never ever change. Whatever is written down in the Loh al-Mahfuz, this can never ever change. Then the second type of Qadr is the Qadr which is written down at the birth of the child. At the birth of the child. And these are the four things that are, sorry, not at the birth, at when the, the spirit is blown into the child. That these four things are written. That his rizq, his, the span of his life, his deeds, and whether he will be happy or wretched. Meaning Ahlul Jannah or Ahlul uh, Nar. So those are the four things that are written down at the time of when the spirit is blown in. And this is from the Qadr that can be changed. And we'll talk about how Qadr can actually be changed. Then the third type of Qadr that is written down. And that is the Qadr that is written down every year on the night of Laylatul Qadr. On the night of Laylatul Qadr itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the angels write down Qadr at that time. Some of the scholars have held an opinion that there is a fourth type of Qadr and that is a Qadr that is written down on a daily basis. That is a Qadr that is written down on a daily basis. And that is uh, from the verse in Surah Al-Rahman where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says كُلَّ يَوْمٍ هُوَ فِي شَأْن That every day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has an affair. And he said that this affair is the writing down of the Qadr. But this was held by some of the, the predecessors and not all the predecessors held this opinion. So this leads us into what does it mean that Qadr can be changed. 
So what is written in the Loh al-Mahfuz is the final decree. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is inside the Loh al-Mahfuz. No one else knows what's inside the Loh al-Mahfuz. That is the final decree. The second types of the writing, the, we'll call this the rest of the types, the second type. And those are the types that the angels know. Those are the things that the angels know that they will be dictated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but as they're gradually happening and they can gradually change as well. What changes those things? A person making dua. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa says that nothing changes qadr like dua. So the angels write down one thing, a person makes dua, Allah changes their fate from the second type of qadr and that is what it means qadr changing. Likewise, committing sins, they cut off a person's risk. A person is supposed to have an X, Y, Z amount of risk destined for them. That's what's in the Loh al mahfud that's not going to change. But however, what the angels write, the more sins you commit, then the less risk you will actually have. And the angels will just subtract that as well. In terms of one's lifespan, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, tells us that nothing elongates one's lifespan like the keeping of good relationship with one's family members, right? So this is from the second type of Qadr. It is not from the Qadr that is written in the Loh al -Mahfuth. Then the third stage of belief, we said is to believe in the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how nothing happens except by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is the difference between Mashia and Irada? The will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us. The Mashia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only of one type. What Allah wills, will happen. That's what it means. When Allah wills something, it will happen. You can try your utmost best to prevent it from happening. Try to avoid it as much as you possibly can, but there's nothing you can do to get out of it. Then the second thing is the irada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the irada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is of two types. And that is al kawniya and al shariya The kawniya is referring to the matters of this world, that Allah wants the suns to set. Allah wants the moon and stars to come out. Allah wants it to rain. So this has nothing to do with us, but this has to do with the external creation, right? So there's no element of reward or punishment related to al-irada al kawniya that you will not be questioned about when the sun set and when it rose and when the rain came down. You're not going to be questioned about that. However, the second type of wanting, which is al-irada al shariya and these are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us, but we have the free will to do them or not. And this is what we will be judged upon. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the commandment to pray. We will be judged upon, did we pray or not? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to be good to our parents. We will be questioned about, were we good to our parents or not? So this is the irada shariya. And this is where a lot of people make a mistake that, hey, if Allah has destined everything, He wants me to be good, I will be good, right? The mistake is in this third level over here that do not confuse the Mashiach of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the irada shari'iyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will force into happening is not the same thing as what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects from you or wants you to do in your life. And then the fourth and last level of Qadr we said is that all of our actions are created. However, the goodness of them, then that is a result from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Whereas the bad of them, then this is a result of our own deeds. This is a result of our own deeds and our own doing. And the clearest indication of this, as the Prophet ﷺ made it very, very clear, was sharru laysa ilik. That when he used to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he used to say, and no evil is attributed to you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in the Quran, ظَهَرَ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحَرِ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِي النَّاسِ That uh, Fasad, evil and wickedness has become present in this world as a result not of Allah's will but because of the evil actions that mankind themselves used to do. So evil is attributed to man and it is never attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now as a sub point related to this, this relates to the concept of good and evil in Islam. That from a Muslim's perspective, is there such a thing as absolute complete evil? And the answer to that is no. There's nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created that is 100% absolute evil. 
And when my teacher was uh, explaining this, he used a funny joke. I don't know, since this is being recorded and live, how well it's going to work. But he said, there's nothing that's 100% absolute pure evil, not even your mother-in-law. <laughs> that's what he said. So I'm just narrating it as he said it. So even if you were to look at the concept of Iblis and Shaitan, is Iblis and Shaitan 100% pure evil? And the answer to that is from our perspective, no, that is not the case. How so? The reason that is, my dear brothers and sisters, because if Iblis and Shaitan did not exist, then we would have no temptations to fight off with which we would not incur any good deeds. If Iblis and Shaitan did not exist, we would not say, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan rajim and get rewarded for that act. So it is through the presence of Iblis that these good deeds are possibly done. Had Iblis not existed, then those deeds could not have been done. So that, in summary, is the portion of the hadith, of the wording of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam. The next part of this narration, they are from the words of Abdullah bin Mas'ud. They are from the words of Abdullah bin Mas'ud, and we'll go through it very quickly and briefly. He says, I swear by Allah, and there is no God other than He, one of you may perform the deeds of the people of paradise, till there is not an arm's length between him and it. Then that which has been written will come forth and he will become from the people of the hellfire. And one of you may perform the deeds of the people of the hellfire till there is not between him an arm's length and it. Then that which has been written will come forth and overtake him and he will become from the people of paradise and will enter into it. So now, this is from the statements of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. And he starts off by swearing, by taking an oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a technique that is used to make a person believe. So a person says something, you know, I will do something. And, you know, you might not believe them. But when the person says, Wallahi, I will do it. You know, you take it more seriously. You think a person is more dedicated that they're swearing by Allah. Right? Unless, actually I don't want to insult the Somalis here. But if they say it, then it has a different meaning altogether. <laughs> no offense, inshallah. Um, so a person takes an oath and that is for the sake of emphasis that look, this is really how it is to make people have conviction and belief in this. Now the reason why this is accepted as a part of the hadith, this is the reason why this is accepted as a part of hadith. This is one of the principles of the science of hadith that if a sahabi ever speaks about a matter of the unseen, even though it is not a hadith, it takes the ruling of a hadith, it takes the ruling of the words of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he couldn't have known this subject matter had it not been for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is why this portion of the hadith, even though it is from the words of Abdullah bin Mas'ud Radiallahu Anhu, it takes the ruling of a hadith because he couldn't have known this other than through the Messenger of Allah. And this is further proven through narrations of Bukhari and Muslim that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made similar statements to this. And that is that a person will do the actions of the people of paradise until Qadr overtakes him and then he goes to the hellfire and vice versa, the opposite as well. Now, how do we explain this subject matter? How do we explain this subject matter? That how is it fair that a person does the actions of the people of Jannah and then all of a sudden Qadr overtakes him and he's thrown in to the hellfire. The way we explain this is that we have a simple principle in hadith. And this is a, a foundation that you should develop for your deen altogether. That if you want to understand anything in this religion, never take an isolated verse, never take an isolated hadith and try to develop a complete understanding. If you want to develop a complete understanding of a subject matter, you have to have all of the texts related to that subject matter. So when you combine all of the texts of uh, a hadith and uh, Quran pertaining to Qadr, pertaining to this subject matter, you will find two things, two things. Number one, is that on the apparent, it seemed like this person was doing actions of the people of paradise. But in reality, this person could have been a hypocrite. That he was hiding his hypocrisy and then he was thrown into the hellfire because it became apparent of his hypocrisy. And that is why that is the case, right? So that is issue number one, is that the person was a hypocrite. Number two, is that maybe it did not reach the level of hypocrisy but there is no sincerity in his actions. So a person is doing all of these deeds that seem great, 
But in reality, there is no sincerity in his actions. There is no sincerity in his actions. And that is why he is thrown into the hellfire. So that explains the first portion of the hadith, where a person will seemingly be from the people of paradise, but in reality isn't, and then he's exposed for that. But how do we explain the second part of the hadith? Where a person seemingly does the actions of the people of the hellfire, but in reality then Qadr overtakes him and he enters into paradise. This too also has two perspectives to it. Number one is that this person has goodness in his heart, but because of his surroundings, he's just been completely led astray. So these are Muslims by definition, that they were raised in a Muslim household. They have Muslim names, but they know nothing about Islam whatsoever. However, as soon as Islam comes to them, they'll accept it right away. And that is what they die upon. And this is what you see some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. They accepted Islam, they went onto the battlefield and they died right away and they were guaranteed paradise. Because they had that goodness, their, their fitrah was still intact. So as soon as Islam came, then all of a sudden, you know, it was very easy for them to accept. Very easy for them to accept. And then there was a second approach that was taken pertaining to the second part. And this is something that is important to know as well. Our predecessors, when they spoke about Qadr, they had two important principles relating to it. And this is what I want to conclude with. Number one is that Qadr Sirrullah. It is the secret of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the secret of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not truly be understood. Meaning that as much as you try to put your intellect to it, you're not truly going to understand how it works. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond space and time. He is the creator of the intellects. And therefore anything we understand is restricted to space and time. And is restricted to what our minds can possibly comprehend. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond that. The second principle they had. That when it comes to matters of Qadr, pass it just as it came. Meaning that a hadith pertaining to Qadr, ayat pertaining to Qadr, don't try to dwell into them, but rather just pass them on as they came. As long as you believe this is from the Messenger of Allah, accept it at face value. Don't question it. Don't challenge it. Because at the end of the day, the Messenger of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't lose anything. But you are the one that's going to lose out by trying to question it. And this is where submission and faith come into play. That your Islam is based upon submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as long as you continuously submit to Allah, you will be guided. But the second you try to rebel and start questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that is when you have already begun to go astray. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Now I'm assuming we have questions. People have questions? Khair. We'll leave uh, five 10 minutes for questions with the night ta'ala and we'll call it a night. Jazakum Allah khairan to everyone for sticking around. I know usually we conclude at 9, but I took the extra 10 minutes to explain that. Anything that I have said that is correct is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that I have said that is incorrect is from myself and from shaitan. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.